comprised of the internal and the external components. And I think that the internal is really the most important. It's, it's steadying and readying yourself for this work, which is a true labor of love. So um, number one share that I'd like to provide for you all today is not allowing your mind to hold on to limiting beliefs. You plus hard work will equate to success. Remember that it takes 10,000 hours of working toward your goal through practice to master anything. Number two, be authentic. Have your own unique vision. And, and you know, you are the only you. And so if you are true to you as a creative, you will come through and the public will sense and feel that from you and be drawn to your work. Um, Dalji, she is an example. She's oh sitting God. here in the first row. <laughs> Dalji, will you please say hello to the group? Dalji's, Dalji's piece is this breathtaking tapestry right here, yes, right here next to Erin Kendrick's piece. And um, Dalji made that for our show in December when she was traveling back and forth to India, which was also just extraordinary because she was creating it and tenderly holding it like an infant as she traveled with it. So anyway, I just, you know, Dalji's work, work is such a great example of her being her. That piece of work is, is her biography, you know, put out into the universe as artwork. Um, number three, don't worry about competing with the world and don't think that your fellow artists are your competition. The only competition that you have is yourself. So always be working to, um, you know, to hone yourself in your art and don't allow, again, going back to those limiting beliefs, other people's success to deter you from your own. Um, your goal should always be to be the best artist that you're capable of being and not to become famous or to make a lot of money from your, from your work. We all know that if you, if you continue to hone and move forward that notoriety and financial support will come. Um, if that means you know, earning, a earning a living from a day job, obviously that's perfectly okay. In fact, almost all artists have a day job. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can't create beauty in the world if we're not financially sound. Um, and you know, let's be honest too, there's truly not enough collectors in the world to support all of the talent that exists in the world. So I just want to remind you guys, to um, our artists in the room, to, to always keep your chin up and stay true to yourself. Okay, so number four. Um, this is kind of really where the rubber meets the road. Set and write down your personal goals. You can read online how to create a personal strategic plan, um, and I highly advise you to do this for yourself. It's the greatest gift that you can give yourself. When I stepped away from Unity Plaza, um, uh, which was a very difficult time because I had actually closed my art consulting and gallery business in order to help with that project. Um, you know, and again, here's the universe at work. Um, I, I decided that I was ready to really commit to a specific path in my life instead of you know, trying all of these wonderful things and kind of letting the universe move me. And so I wrote a personal strategic plan, and that really helped me to narrow my focus of where I wanted to go. And I'm not kidding you, two weeks after I stepped away from that role, I got a call from the airport asking me if I would come direct the art program. So, you know, again, when you create personal strategic plans, it's also like setting an intention and letting the universe know what direction you want to go in. Um, so when you craft a personal strategic plan, it will really help you by writing down your mission, your vision. You'll do a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis, a SWOT analysis, really about yourself, right? There's internal components for success. There's internal components for failure. There's external components for success. There's external components for failure. And if you gather all that information, you can create a strategy that helps you to leap over those things and use your gifts to move forward. Um, and so from that, you will naturally create your own personal goals and objectives. So I just ask you to always begin with the end in mind. So in the external elements of being a successful artist, um, 
allowing the world of collectors and arts administration arts administrators to find you and selling your work is obviously critical. Um, and I know that in this in this space, I'm probably going to tell several of you things that you already know. But hopefully, this kind of just helps to reinforce the basics. Um, clearly, it's all it all begins with. Marketing, marketing, marketing. How do you want to be seen? What tools do you want to create for yourself so that you are reaching the widest audience and that when you're putting your effort out to reach the widest audience, that it's successful, that you're getting your message across and that you're making an impact. So it obviously starts with, and I know, again, there are certain things that I will say that some folks will say, oh gosh, Jen, seriously, but good images. It starts with great images of your work. There's a number of fantastically talented and incredibly um, well-priced resources in the community, like Laird with Black Palm, Mark Prancer, um, Dan Harris, um, who take work, who take professional photography of other artists' work for their portfolios. That kind of resource can be invaluable because the buying public is a very fickle public. We're, you know, images always in our face constantly. So it's the beautiful, um, depth-filled, quality lighting, non-pixelated imagery that's gonna get you in the door, and get you first in the door. Um, in this day and age, it's still important to have something tangible. A one-page, two-sided PDF about you and your work. A brief artist statement, that's direct and speaks from your heart, but is not um, too frou-frou is really important. You know, get to the point, speak your mind, state your work. Um, contact information. Obviously, you need to have a website. There's great resources available in this day and age. I love personally working with Wix. Charlotte Valesky um, uses the free version of Wix. I mean, there's fabulous resources out there. You can have a website for $13 and own your own domain in this day and age. So it really doesn't get any better than that. Um, Weebly is another good platform. Um, Gordon Megason uses um, art storefronts. That's a much more expensive product. But if you are, if you, if you develop a lot of inventory and you're very interested in a successful e-commerce site, art storefronts can be um, a really good match for you. Um, the Obviously, social media is really key. Right now, Instagram is the fastest growing social media platform specifically for the visual arts. Facebook is still hanging in there. Certainly, you know, we use um, Pinterest when it comes to the visual, but those are really sort of the key social media um, marketing vehicles for artists in this day and age. Um, Etsy stores can be fabulous. Etsy is still a very, very viable sales tool. And then a lot of artists are using Saatchi, um, Saatchi.com, S-A-A-T-C-H-I. Um, I know Tiffany Manning is a big fan of Saatchi. She's had a lot of positive results there. So that's an online art sales vehicle. So you are the vehicle um, to move this information. Once you have your, your toolkit ready, then, then it's time to launch and start you know, blanketing the certain industries that, are, that need you to contact them. And so, these industries are really critical. Number one, there are so many national arts advocacy resources, and it all starts, in my belief, by becoming a member of Americans for the Arts. When you become a member of Americans for the Arts, you um, can attend national conferences that have great price points and bring in the decision makers and really just the, the major thought leaders in our industry in the, in the business of arts and public arts administration. Um, you have an opportunity to network with professionals that like you are, are really advocating for themselves to have a, a highly successful career. Um, you have access to mentors. You again will meet people that are the thought leaders and these people are dedicated to helping the visual artists throughout the country and frankly throughout the world to be successful. That's why they do the work that they do. Um, and then you also have access to join their public art listserv. And um, Glenn, are you still here? 
Is Len still here? So if you join the Public Art Listserv, you get to hear from Glenn Weiss a couple times a month, which is so much fun because he is a mentor to many people through that vehicle. But the Public Art Listserv is um, just priceless. That's where all of the national calls to artists are posted. So these are projects at $2,500 to projects that are $2.5 million. And they're not just for large scale outdoor sculpture. They're for paintings, they're for portraits, they're for art restoration, they're for appraisal work, they're for commissions, they're for sculptures, obviously. They're for interactive light features. Um, they're for any number of incredible um, visual piece, um, art piece that human beings make. Um, and you also, by becoming a member of Americans for the Arts, have access to the, the incredible wealth of grants that are available nationwide. Um, I also highly recommend, um, if you're interested in grant writing as a vehicle to support yourself um, and to move your work forward, there are several books um, that are available through Amazon. If you just look up arts grant writing, you will find them. Um, but there are, there's a couple of just amazing experts in the industry. Um, and then also through Americans for the Arts, you receive literally in your email, um, the 2020 guide to public arts grants for artists. So, you know, it's just, it couldn't be a better resource. So that's my number one. Um, I would also suggest that you search for other arts advocacy groups online. Americans for the Arts is the biggest. Um, it, it pulls all of us together in our nation, but there are a lot of arts advocacy groups and they need you. Um, number two, corporate buyers, art consulting firms, and architects and design, architecture and design firms. So Ellen has the next, um, every single artist lounge taking place in April. Ellen, what's the date again? It's the second Tuesday. Okay. So yeah, second yeah. Tuesday, and whose studio is it at? Is that, is that the Beaches Museum? Yeah. Museum? Oh, Preaches Museum, yeah. awesome. Preaches Museum, right. perfect. So, so Studio M and Amanda Webster. Yep, so Amanda Webster and Marsha Faulkner are two of the most successful art collecting interior designers in the entire region. I was an art consultant to both of them um, prior to being in the nonprofit arts market. And um, they are such advocates, so you definitely have to attend that event. Um, Marsha and Amanda will really illuminate on this part of how important it is to reach out to, um, to the A and D community, we call them architecture and design. Um, but having your toolkit, your website, your PDF, your business card, having just that easy Passover information about yourself to give to these folks is critical. Um, but you can find the a and community again online. Get their contact information. Share your information. They don't know that you exist unless you empower them to know that you exist. And they hold on to that information. I am telling you, um, it, at the gallery, you know, certainly where there was only eight galleries in Northeast Florida, so we received a lot of solicitation from artists. I had stacks and stacks of it. But when I got a big job for say B or for Baptist or for Florida, credit union, I went to that stack. That was my Bible and started flipping. So that material gets used. It's really important. Sending it electronically, having it available online, and getting it physically in the hands of the people that need you as a solution is really key. Um, so city and government. Um, you all are here because you are already um, aware that the Cultural Council is a phenomenal resource for our community. But there are other community centers. Um, the Beaches Museum is a great example of a community center that has shows for artists. The Adele Grage Community Center in Atlantic Beach. Um, there are many community centers in, in our area. And then of course the airport. The airport is a governmental institution. So be thinking outside the box as far as other places where you see art if you see artwork in those facilities, find out who's responsible for putting it there and get your information in their hands. Healthcare is huge. Um, I don't know if many of you all um, know that both Ellen and myself were healthcare art consultants for many, many years. Ellen was with Vogel Fine Art and I owned my own business, R. Roberts Gallery, 
And so, um, whereas Ellen and her team are consulted for Baptist South, I handled Baptist Downtown. While they did Memorial Hospital, I did St. Vincent's. So we, again, need to know about your work, um, but there are people within those organizations with whom we work that need to know about your work. And those are their marketing departments, and they oftentimes have their own on-staff interior design firm, or their, well, sorry, their interior design employees. Um, employees that work for the hospital that are responsible for the aesthetic upkeep of the space. So make sure that you're looking for um, the folks that are actually in those decision-making seats inside healthcare. Um, art and healing has much like art and aviation is not an afterthought any longer. It is a critical component of what we bring to the public. Um, the, uh, there is a movement that began about 20 years ago that was called evidence-based medicine. And it was in this report that came out, it proved through years of research that patients in hospital settings where artwork is available to them have a higher success, a higher healing success rate. So there is a very literal connection between seeing something joyful, feeling joyful, and getting better. Galleries are making a comeback. I'm really excited about that. You know, we, I closed the retail frontage of our Roberts Gallery in 2011 um, due to the recession, and I took my art consulting business home and I ran my, my healthcare art consulting and my, I, you know, did art consulting for, for banks and for, you know, for businesses. For B, I did B2B. And um, that was a wonderful time of my life. My children were young, um, but it was very, very, very sad to watch my previous competitors, you know, with whom one would have a, you know, a healthy competitive relationship, but who genuinely were my friends and watching their businesses fail. So it is a new day, notwithstanding the coronavirus that we're having. <laughs> <laughs> However, we are emerging again to have enough business for that middle market, right? Um, the recession did great things for artists, though. I do want to point that out. Um, you know, galleries had been the norm for so long, and galleries, I think in some cases, not my gallery, not Ellen's gallery, but could abuse that power, right? They, they enjoyed being the gatekeepers between the artist and the collector. Um, the, the most important sort of relationship in, in this industry is the artist, the dealer, and the collector. That's a beautiful classical triangle. That's how it has worked for hundreds and hundreds of years now. Um, but the recession did a great thing for artists in that it killed the middleman. So the, art, the artists were their own independent businesses. And in many ways, I think, especially in Northeast Florida, because I've gotten to see it here, I really feel like it elevated our arts community because there was not a barrier any longer. So I think that there are some great new galleries coming online. There's new galleries in San Marco. There's new galleries opening in Fernandina. There's um, a very healthy art market in St. Augustine. Um, and on that note regarding galleries, it is so important that you reach out to galleries that are not in the community in which you live. And here's why. You will find that there will inadvertently be client experiences where an artist, an artist's work has been seen at an art gallery, you know, that has $30,000 a month in overhead, but then that person figures out that that artist lives in the community, bypasses the, the, the podium or the, the platform by which the, um, the for-profit business and goes direct to the artist. Those types of experiences really, really hurt the gallery as a vehicle to support you. So how you can get around that is working with galleries that are in other markets so that you don't have to ever be concerned about that conflict of interest. Um, and, and really, I find that that, um, from the business of art perspective, um, has been, in years past, pretty critical. Not to work with artists in your region, which is such a shame, um, but it's because you can't control what the public does sometimes. So do not be deterred if a gallery 
does not work with local artists, it's only because of that challenge. It's for no other reason. And so please make sure that you're reaching out nationally. Um, when you're looking for a gallery to represent you, look for a gallery that clearly has a vibe and a vision and artwork that you believe your artwork melds well with. Collectors are attracted to art galleries because of the art, because of the staff. This is how this is the loyalty piece. Um, and because they feel respected and understood as collectors and that they can trust the people that are art Sherpas on their behalf. Um, collectors' tastes are interesting in that when an art collector is, um, is collecting artwork, this is a beautiful psychological thing, um, their art collection ends up being a visual biography of who they are as a human being. That's why the collecting happens, right? This piece um, by Teresa strikes me because it reminds me of my childhood backyard. You know, this piece by Michelle Katz, which is 2,700 Legos, makes me think of my child who I lost in the war. I mean, you know, tr truly, 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 we collect art because it is symbolic of our experience living. And so when you're looking at galleries, look for um, galleries that, that feel like your work is a good fit with the family of artists they represent because we don't want to just be buying the artwork for over our fireplace and over our headboards, but nonetheless, that's also a part of it. And so when the works complement each other, not only is the gallery more successful, um, but the artists themselves are more successful as a unit and your work will sell more. So um, pricing is something that I oftentimes find myself getting to mentor artists regarding. Um, and this has been my advice to people over the last 24 years. Um, we price artwork in the business world by dimensional inch, link times width. So when you do the math, um, you, can, you can choose for yourself what you want your per inch price to be. Because again, in the collecting world, an, a collector automatically feels that this piece is more expensive than this piece, just based on size. And so in, again, as kind of doldrum as that might come across, it really is a way that you can establish your pricing and it's a way that you can grow your pricing year after year. I recommend that artists, as they're you know, gaining traction, increase their price per square inch by 10% or so a year. More if you want, but if there's a logic behind it, the public can understand it and the collectors can track it. And people like me who are working on becoming a certified appraiser can also factor in more easily. Um, yes. Ashley. When it comes to three-dimensional work, um, is it volumetric or? I would say it's volumetric. I really would. Yeah, and again, because it's it's so based on what people see, right? More equals more. Right. So yes. I have a question uh, that I've been going in into. Sometimes the uh, the details are. Let's say we're going into miniature work. So how do you say? that that's where you you become your own advocate and you really I mean you're a small business you can do whatever the hell you want to do which is okay. great right <laughs> truly okay. as long as there's logic behind it when people ask you that question you can say well there are 1,000 stitches per square inch in this piece there are 100 in this much looser piece bingo it's logic so um, I love that I had some questions because that's kind of my overview, and I wanted to open it up for questions. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. In your